Hello, I'm Lawrence, a London-based speaker, writer and guide, and I specialise in the history of science, engineering and medicine. It's become a bit of a mission of mine to restore some amazing but forgotten characters to the limelight, and here I shall be talking about a Victorian medical man, Thomas Wakeley. Wakeley trained as a surgeon, but became a journalist exposing not peccadilloes, but the sins of comfortable cliques, bullies, poisoners and quacks. He was not one for wafting through the hospital wards, but for keeping a cool head in the mortuary and in the courtroom. Footnote 1. His biographer, Charles Brooke, many years ago sought out a living relative and ascertained that the name should be pronounced Wakely. Footnote 2. Brooke's book, because it was printed during the Second World War austerity, consists of greyish sheets rather like inferior toilet paper. I'm going to let Charles Dickens open my account of Thomas Wakeley. In 1848, 150 children at Bartholomew Druitt's farming establishment for pauper children in Tooting died of cholera. The matter was reported upon by Dickens. He wrote, Tooting Churchyard became too small for the piles of children's coffins that were carried out of this Elysium every day. The learned coroner for the county of Surrey deemed it quite unnecessary to hold any inquests on these dead children being as perfectly satisfied in his own mind that Mr. Druitt's farm was the best of all possible farms. Presuming that this learned functionary will be duly complimented on his sagacity, we will refer to the proceedings before a very different kind of coroner, Mr. Wakeley. Certain of the miserable little creatures removed from Tooting happened to die in Mr. Wakeley's jurisdiction. Mr. Wakeley holds inquests. It then comes out that Mr. Druitt is not altogether that golden farmer he is supposed to be. That supposed heaven on earth exceeds in offensiveness anything ever yet witnessed by the inspector. He has a habit of putting four cholera patients in one bed surrounded by every offensive, indecent and barbarous circumstance that can aggravate the horrors of the condition and increase the dangers of infection. Druitt was found not guilty of manslaughter, but anyway, he died shortly after. Wakeley grew up on a farm in the west of England and after finishing school, trained as an apothecary and surgeon and in 1819 he set up in practice in London. It was not long after that that he was nearly killed the victim of a case of mistaken identity. A number of political revolutionaries from the Cato Street conspiracy had been condemned to death. The condemned men were publicly executed at Newgate in the presence of an enormous crowd on May Day 1820. The bodies were allowed to hang for half an hour when they were taken down and a masked man stepped onto the scaffold and decapitated them, handing each severed head to an assistant. The performer of this unsavoury task was clothed in a rough seaman's guernsey but so deftly and speedily did he perform the decapitations that he roused in the minds of those who saw him a suspicion that he was a member of the medical profession. The crowd deeply resented the mutilation of the dead and they yelled execrations at the man in the mask. And the feeling of disgust thus crudely expressed by the mob was echoed by many more responsible people and was centred upon the unknown operator. A scurrilous newspaper report then mentioned a young surgeon of Argyle Street, and Thomas Wakeley, 
being the only person to fit this description, was attacked sometime later on the 27th of August, 1820. In this criminal attempt on his life, he was saved from a fatal head injury by having a bandage round his head to hold in place a couple of leeches that he'd applied. Perhaps this is the only time that a patient in the 19th century derived any benefit from the widespread use of leeches. Having applied two leeches to my temples in consequence of dimness of sight and the leeches not readily taking, I was kept up till the late period of after 12 o'clock. About this time when preparing for bed, I heard a knocking at the door. Who is there? A person answered, I am come, sir, from Mr. Iverts of Gerard's Hall, who is very ill and wishes you to go immediately. The man asked for a glass of cider, having walked very fast to the house. On my return into the passage, I was knocked down by a blow from behind upon the upper part of the right side of my head. When on the ground, I also had inflicted on my chest two slight stabs. I cannot say how long I remained in a state of insensibility, but at length got sufficiently recovered to find that I was enveloped in flames and a suffocating smoke. My situation cannot be described. It was the very climax of horror. In my delirium, I ran to the pump in order to prevent the lead which was above me from melting and fall in a fluid state upon my head. But finding myself nearly suffocated, I was enabled to get hold of a beam under the skylight. I then broke the glass and got through. Wakeley's travels were not over. Having lately married, he had increased the value of his home insurance just before the fire, and the insurance company suspected Wakeley of a fraud. It was only by recourse to the courts that the matter was eventually resolved. Wakeley founded a medical journal in 1823. It's called The Lancet. Well respected, it is still going to this day. Man, he wrote in his preface to the first issue, studies with the greatest attention and assiduity the constitutions of his horses and dogs and learns all their peculiarities, whilst of the nature of his own he is totally uninformed and equally unskilled as regards his infant offspring. Yet a little reflection and application would enable him to avert from himself and family half the constitutional disorders which affect society. And in addition to these advantages, his acquirements in medical learning would furnish him with a test whereby he could detect and expose the impositions of ignorant practitioners. The name Lancet has a double meaning. It's a high window which you find in a cathedral, letting in a shaft of light but it's also a medical instrument which you can use for pricking a boil. In the cemetery at Kensal Green in London is a large monument, one among many. But this is not Wakeley's grave, and we're away short of that part of his story yet, though he was laid to rest without any great pomp nearby. This magnificent monument is to the charlatan and quack doctor John St. John Long, from whom Wakeley sought to protect the public. The role of advocate against Long was taken by Wakeley in a particularly vile case of quackery. John St. John Long treated a consumptive girl for whom there was no hope. But turning to her healthy sister, he anointed her skin and inflamed it with his potion, making out that it meant that there was diseased tissue beneath. Within a fortnight, after continuing painful and unnecessary treatment, the sister was dead. This matter came to court. Long's counsel tried to persuade the jury that her death was due to 
the error of diet committed by the unfortunate victim in assuaging her feverish thirst with plums. But Long was convicted of manslaughter and fined £250, a large sum. But he had so many customers and admirers that he was able to pay on the spot and walked away, free to prey on others. He died of consumption. Wakeley stood as a member of Parliament so that the House of Commons should have medical expertise when confronted with arguments from vested interests. He is depicted here as presiding at a political inquest. The Medical Witnesses Act of 1836 was sponsored by Wakeley. Normally only the deaths of the high and mighty might be properly looked into by medical experts at an inquest. His act ensure that expert witnesses were, for the first time, paid and might give evidence whoever was the deceased. The first medically qualified person in England to become a coroner was, you guessed it, Thomas Wakeley in 1839. Private John Frederick White was found to have died from the mortal effects of a severe and cruel flogging of 150 lashes of the Cat O' Nine Tales in 1846. The resulting outcry initiated by this verdict in Wakeley's coroner's court saw the amount of flogging in the army permanently reduced. Cases of untimely, mysterious or accidental death would perhaps for the first time get the scrutiny they deserved. When the master of Hendon Workhouse quibbled about the identification of the deceased at one of Wakeley's inquests, a man who had fallen into a vat of boiling water in a laundry, Wakeley asked, Pray, sir, how many paupers have you boiled? In the 1850s, the water that people drank and the food that they ate was heavily contaminated by filth or deliberately adulterated to bulk it up or improve its appearance and increase profits. Dr Arthur Hill Hassel was an enthusiast of the newly improved microscope and he came to Wakeley's notice. Hassel's efforts to expose fraudulent and dangerous adulteration of common groceries for profit was supported in the Lancet under the banner of the Analytical and Sanitary Commission. Wakeley thought that only naming and shaming guilty traders would improve purity. Here's the report on cayenne or red pepper. And another one on brightly coloured sweets shaped like animals. The result of all this work was legislation, the Food and Drugs Act of 1860. Wakeley was so busy that his carriage was fitted with a wooden flap for writing and fittings to facilitate dining on the move. In a day he included editorial work for The Lancet, several inquests, perhaps 80 miles of travel, entertaining and his work as a member of parliament. Historical writer A. N. Wilson described him as one of the most magnificently angry men of his age. I very much hope you've enjoyed watching.